You know, I want to share just a short story that just about brought me to tears when I read it. Um, this is from our dear brother in Christ over in Zambia named Edward. Edward and I have been working together now for about 14 years. And uh, we have a radio program that goes over a lot of Africa. It says this, an Eritrean national called me this afternoon. His voice was weak, but I could hear what he was saying. He said his name was Muhatu Mumad. He was calling me from the Eritrea Highlands. I don't even know where that is in Africa. What's that? Part of Ethiopia. Okay, thank you, ma'am. Mohatu told me in a weak voice to inform the American that through his teaching, God has turned him from committing suicide. He spoke slowly. He had lost his family during the war with Ethiopian soldiers who still kill innocent Eritreans. Last year, he was driving in their family car going to the mosques. So obviously, Muhatu was a Muslim. He was stopped at gunpoint by Ethiopian soldiers who were wearing masks. He identified them to be Ethiopian militia. Now this part's very gruesome, but it's, it's reality. They caught him. They took advantage of his wife and his daughter, whom they then shot after raping them. Mahatu was taken to a military camp where he was tortured for weeks until the Eritrean government got involved in and he was released. He was taken to the hospital in Eritrea and was treated, but his mind was not free. Memories of the death of his wife and his daughter, as you can only imagine, and this is an understatement, Memories of the death of his wife and daughter were haunting him. So he started to plan to be a terrorist who would get bombs and detonate them in Ethiopian barracks so that he would revenge the death of his wife and daughter. He started making contacts from his fellow Muslim men, but his efforts were not successful. One day he thought of committing suicide, but before he could do that, he visited a small shop where he found a young man who was selling food and other commodities. He asked that young man about weapons and bombs. The young man was a Christian believer. He saw in his eyes and knew that Muhatu was very serious. He instead gave him a small radio, which he tuned to Kavu. That's the radio program we're on. And at that time, when he tuned in, the American was talking about the Amazing Grace series. Mahatu reached home and listened to a sermon that you were teaching. For the first time, he held his breath when the American mentioned about God's love and his unchanging character. Mahatu's attention was riveted when the series was over, he listened to the Revelation series and other series which started to shape his mind. He found a new man called Jesus who forgives. And it was Jesus whom he got attracted to in the series. By the time the Daniel series was over, Mahatu's heart had changed. And he started smiling for the first time since the death of his wife. He developed love for Jesus who had died and rose again for him. He was so much encouraged from the studies in Revelation 4, 12, and 21, so much that he appreciated every word. He told his friends about Jesus. He learned about the Sabbath and many truths which he said have saved him from being a devil. Early this year he developed a heart condition and he has been unwell. He was able to call me and share with me this story. Currently, 
Mahatu is in a clinic in Eritrea. He listens to the morning program. He told me I should inform the American that his messages have saved him from becoming a suicide terrorist. He has learned to forgive like the good man of Israel, Jesus Christ. He told me that to tell the American never to shut his mouth. What comes out of the American's mouth is hidden manna. Mahatu revealed that he has listened to the sermons. They have opened his eyes so wide. He wants to get everything that I have. Amen. Eugene, you hit it right on the head. The Lord Jesus can take any human being no matter where we are, no matter what we've gone through, no matter what we're struggling with today, and He will reach down and touch us. And He will let us know that we are loved and that we're forgiven for the past and that He wants to dwell with us today. I'm so thankful this morning that Jesus saw Mahatu who was ferociously struggling, struggling, and he changed his life. The Lord Jesus did that. And he can do the same for each one of us today. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, as I think about different Bible characters. Nebuchadnezzar is one that stands out, but you know, in a more close proximity in time to us today, there's some characters, some human beings who I'm fascinated by, and two of those are the men that we often talk about around 1888. And one man's name, of course, was E.J. Wagoner. The other man's name, of course, is A.T. Jones. And you know, these two men, in many ways, go beyond life. They're, they transcend the normal because of the fact that Ellen White said that God used these men to bring a message in 1888 to shake Seventh-day Adventism and to turn them back from the law, the law, the law to seeing Jesus Christ in the law, which was something that Seventh-day Adventists were not clear on for the first 40-odd years of their existence. And so... I had often heard stories about E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones, and I thought, I want to find out for myself about these men's lives that have in so many ways transcended humanity. I mean, A.T. Jones, in the late 1880s into the 1890s, A.T. Jones actually spoke before the Congress of the United States. And he warned America from the halls of Congress not to pass the Blair Bill, which would have brought in a National Sunday Law. So these remarkable men, E.J. Wagoner was one of the two men that brought the message of righteousness by faith to the Seventh-day Adventist Church in 1888. This was not a new message, but one the Adventists had not focused on for the first 40 years of their existence. In fact, the denomination had preached the law so long that it was as dry as the hills of Gilboa. E.J. Wagoner simply brought the message of Christ and his righteousness as the only means whereby anyone could keep the law of God. You know, it, it doesn't take a rocket scientist to understand why 
the early Seventh-day Adventists had fallen into that rut. Because after 1844, and as Edson and Crozier and others started to understand that Christ was in the most holy place, and that that door that had been closed for 1,800 years was now open, and that in that most holy place was the Ark of the Covenant, God's law. And therein, of course, was the Seventh-day Sabbath. And so the Seventh-day Adventists, this little group in the northeastern part of the United States, they had rediscovered great truths of the sanctuary, the investigative judgment, and the perpetuity of God's law. Well, folk, as they understood those things, the world came at them with every weapon of hell to try to stop them. And so the Seventh-day Adventists became very adroit at finding all the Bible verses that focused on the eternal nature of the Ten Commandments. And so they became very good at debating about the nature of the Ten Commandments. But it got so bad in Seventh-day Adventism that Ellen White said, we've preached the law for so long, it's as dry as the hills of Gilboa. Well, in the 1880s, it was E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones who came to Seventh-day Adventism, who came to Minneapolis in 1888, and they said, we as a people are trying to commit an impossible act. We can't keep the law of God by ourselves. I mean, think about it for a minute. Romans 7 verse 18 says, For I know that in me, that is in my flesh, dwelleth no good thing. And we know in that very same chapter, in Romans chapter 7, the Bible says, Wherefore the law is holy, and the commandment is holy, and just, and good. So how can people who are not good keep a law that is good? E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones said, that's impossible. And they were exactly right. The Apostle Paul in Romans 7, verse 24, he said, O oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? Well, E.J. Wagoner and A.T. Jones recognized that within men, within humanity, is death. And the law of God is life. So how does death embrace life? It can't happen. Not, not by ourselves it can't. And so for 40 years, Seventh-day Adventists were trying to commit the impossible. Couldn't do it. Jones and Wagner came along in 1888 and said, we have left somebody out of this equation. And that's Jesus. Jesus, in our humanity, kept the law of God. He was righteous. We are unrighteous. The law is righteous. But we can connect to him through prayer and submission to God's word. And he can empower us to do what we can't do. Even to keep God's law. And so Jones and Wagner came in 1888 and before that in Signs of the Times and other periodicals and Sabbath school lessons. And Jones and Wagner preached that obedience to the law of God can only occur through faith in Jesus Christ. And Ellen White endorsed them. Testimonies to Ministers, pages 91 and 92. She says, The Lord, in His great mercy, sent a most precious message to His people through Elders Wagner and Jones. 
This message was to bring more prominently before the world the uplifted Savior, the sacrifice for the sins of the whole world. It presented justification through faith and the surety. It invited the people to receive the righteousness of Christ, which is made manifest in obedience to all the commandments of God. Many had lost sight of Jesus. They needed to have their eyes directed to his divine person, his merits, and his changeless love for the human family. All power is given into his hands that he may dispense rich gifts unto men, imparting the priceless gift of his own righteousness to the helpless human agent. This is the message that God commanded to be given to the world. And folk, if we rightly study and understand each one of the three angels' messages, they look at those two concepts right through. Fear God, give glory to Him, the hour of His judgment, worship Him, Babylon is fallen, and if any man worship the beast in His image. They all point out the fact that we desperately need Christ's righteousness and that we are helpless human agents. It runs right through every one of the three angels' messages. That was the 1888 message. A.T. Jones, E.J. Wagner, Ellen White, they preached the righteousness of Jesus. In fact, in Special Testimonies to Ministers and Workers, Series A, page uh, 1897, pages 61 and 62, it says this, None but God can subdue the pride of man's heart. We can't subdue it, friends. We cannot save ourselves. We cannot regenerate ourselves. In the heavenly courts there will be no song sung to me that loved myself and washed myself, redeemed myself. Unto me be glory and honor, blessing and praise. But this is the keynote of the song that is sung by many here in this world. They do not know what it means to be meek and lowly in heart. And they do not mean to know this if they can avoid it. The whole gospel is comprised in learning of Christ, his meekness and lowliness. Well, how does all that happen? How, how and where and when do we learn of Christ? If that is the whole gospel, how do we do that? How do we do that? We've got to spend time We've got to spend time in prayer. We've got to spend time and open our Bibles and memorize Scripture. We've got to do that, friends. There's not an alternative. You say, well, I'm, I'm, I'm working hard. I, I keep the Sabbath, and uh, I, I'm trying to be a good person. That's impossible. It's impossible for us to be good people. We can't be good people. Jeremiah 17, 9 tells us about our condition. It says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? That's our heart. We're deceptive, we're cunning, we're crafty by ourselves. And we can't produce anything but that. You say, but I do some good things. Yeah, but folk, they're all tainted with selfishness. They're all tainted with selfishness because we want people to think good of us. And the only way that that can change is in learning of Christ. Spending time with Jesus Christ. You know, it's often puzzled me. It's often puzzled me. 
because my wife is from the Middle East. I was recently over there. And I noticed whenever we went into somebody's home, immediately the wife and the older daughters, you know what they do? They disappear, Mary. They headed out to the kitchen. They were going to take care of their guests. I remember one, one day we went over to my wife's older, uh, older sister's home. And uh, we, we came over just to visit. Immediately she disappeared. Her daughter disappeared. And I, I told my wife, I said, now, now, Hoda, please, just, you know, we're going in. Just tell your sister, we're not hung I'm not hungry. Folk, I could stand on my head and turn blue. That, that wouldn't make any difference at all. Because that's custom. That's the way you do it in the Middle East. She was gone. Her, her daughter was gone. Magda and Miriam are her, their names. Twenty minutes later, they came out, and folk, it was, it was a, a six-course meal. You know, it was falafel and, and pita bread and hummus and uh, cucumber and tomato and fried potatoes and it just and stuffed grape leaves and, and stuffed um, zucchini. That's the way it is in the Middle East. But you know, when Jesus told the story in Luke chapter 10, verses 38 to 42, he came into Lazarus' home. Martha headed straight to the kitchen because she was following custom. But Mary didn't go. Mary stayed out and sat at Jesus' feet and heard what he was having to say. And you can, you can just picture Martha, you know, she's just pulling her hair out trying to get a meal ready for at least 14 hungry men. So she comes out and she says, Lord, don't you care that my sister has left me to serve alone? Bid her, therefore, please tell her to come out in the kitchen and help me. And Jesus said, Martha, Martha, you are careful and troubled about many things. But one thing is needful. And Mary has chosen that good part which shall not be taken away from her. Folk, Mary was connecting herself to divinity. We all have challenges, friend. Every person in this room, we all have challenges. We all have struggles and trials. The only way we can deal with them and receive the approbation of God is by connecting ourselves to divinity by connecting ourselves to a righteousness that is foreign to our carnal, sinful hearts. What, what is justification by faith? Ellen White asked, she said, what is justification by faith? It is the work of God in laying the glory of man in the dust and doing for man that which it is not in his power to do for himself. Folk, it's okay for us to come to the end of our ropes. It's okay for us to say, you know, I have a problem. I need help. The key thing is where we go for that help. And Jesus has all the gifts of heaven to bestow upon our need. You say, oh, but mine's too bad. No, it isn't too bad. Because Jesus went from glory to the lowest place. He shut himself away from his Father's presence. He could not see, Desire of Ages says, he could not see through the portals of the tomb. Hope did not present to him his coming forth from the grave triumphant. It didn't. He couldn't see through that. And he did that so that he could extend to you and me help, righteousness. But folk, we can only receive that and only be availed to that 
if we will take out time to spend with him. It's the only way. It's the only way. Philippians 2 says, Let nothing be done through strife or vainglory, but in lowliness of mind, let each esteem the other better than themselves. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus, who being in the form of God, thought it not robbery to be equal with God, but made himself of no reputation, and took upon him the form of a servant and was made in the likeness of men. And being found in fashion as a man, he humbled himself and became obedient unto death, even the death of the cross. He went there, folks, for you. He went there for me. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. You know, after 1888... Many of the brethren rejected the messages of Jones and Wagner. The two men and Ellen White traveled all over the U.S. preaching the message of righteousness by faith in Jesus. Many of the laity embraced it. This went on for about three to four years. But in 1892, 1891, 1892, Ellen White and many of her family went to Australia. E.J. Wagner was sent to England and A.T. Jones stayed in America. And Ellen White wrote this about the two men, letter 24, 1891. She says, it's quite possible that Elder Jones or Wagner may, may be overthrown by the temptations of the enemy. But if they should be, this would not prove that they had had no message from God or that the work that they had done was all a mistake. I pray that these men upon whom God has laid the burden of a solemn work may be able to give the trumpet a certain sound and honor God at every step, that their path at every step may go brighter and brighter till the close of time. So Ellen White had a premonition. Maybe Jones and Wagner will fall away. And folk, tragically, both of them did. Both of them did. You know... When E.J. When e. Wagoner went to England, he led out in many, many things, editorial work. He did the Sabbath school lessons in, in England. He, did, uh, he held Bible conferences for ministerial students. E.J. Wagoner was a very, very busy man. Very busy man. And tragically... Tragically, E.J. Wagoner began to adopt a new idea. Over the next many years in the 1890s, while laboring in Great Britain, Wagoner began to espouse and promulgate views of spiritual affinity. Well, what's that? Well, that's when one not rightfully a marriage partner here might be one in the life to come. And this allows for a present spiritual union. Did you get that? E.J. Wagoner, his wife's name was Jessie Mosier Wagoner. They had three children. One died in infancy. E.J. Wagoner, in his office there in London... His secretary's name was Edith Adams. Edith Adams was a nurse. She was also his secretary. Over time, E.J. Wagoner adopted and felt that the Holy Spirit was leading him to believe that while Jesse Mosier was his wife here on earth, in heaven, Edith Adams would be his wife. And E.J. Wagoner came to believe that the Holy Spirit was leading him. Folk, the Holy Spirit is never leading us when we are walking contrary to the law of God. It's the Holy Spirit's work to exalt the Ten Commandments. So anything that casts doubt on the Ten Commandments, the Holy Spirit is not there. 
But tragically, E.J. Wagoner began to believe. In fact, when he came to the General Conference in 1897, excuse me, 1901 General Conference session, Wagoner was enthused with what he supposed to be precious spiritual light. Letter 224, 1908. Ellen White was shown that instead the views he was then espousing were dangerous, misleading fables. Dr. Wagoner was then departing from the faith in the doctrine he held regarding spiritual affinities. I mean, can you think, of, think about this for a moment? One morning, Dr. Wagner comes down to breakfast. Jesse's prepared for him some oatmeal and raisins and toast. And all of a sudden, he says, Dear, I've got new light from the Lord. And his wife says, Well, what is it, dear? And he says, The Lord showed me the, the beautiful truth about spiritual affinities. And his wife says, What in the world is that? He says, well, it's really simple. See, you and I are married here on this earth, but in heaven, I'm not going to be married to you. I'm going to be married to my secretary. Now, how far do you think that went? <coughs> yeah, it didn't go very far. In fact, it caused the Wagner's family to be split. And around 1905, 1906, they were divorced. And a year later, E.J. Wagoner married his secretary, Edith Adams. Very tragic, folks. Very tragic. While in England, Wagner had become friendly with Edith Adams, his secretary. Ellen White called Wagner's views dangerous, misleading fables. She said Wagner had been sowing the seeds of these satanic theories in England for a long time. A long time. Wagner was married to Jesse Mosier in the late 1870s. They had two children that actually went to adulthood, Bessie and Pearl. Their little boy died in infancy. After their move to England, Wagoner's secretary and former nurse, Edith Adams, came into the picture. During this business arrangement, Wagoner began to believe that the Holy Spirit told him that sometimes people do not marry their true spiritual bride. So the bride they have on earth is not their real partner, but the spiritual bride is. And it is the spiritual bride with whom a person will live for eternity. Wagner was led to believe that Edith Adams was the spiritual bride. Ellen White made it very clear it was not the Lord who showed this to E.J. Wagner. Folk, E.J. Wagner became a man out in the middle of a turbulent ocean. He didn't know which way was up. And you know, as I've analyzed this tragedy from a man who was used by God in 1888, to a man who went off on this satanic delusion. Folk, I sit back and I say, how, how did that happen? And I think it came down to the fact that E.J. Wagoner got too busy. He was under a lot of strain. And he got too busy doing the Lord's work so that he didn't have time to let the Lord work on him. And folk, that is our greatest temptation today, is thinking that we're doing the Lord's work and we're Seventh-day Adventists and we're proclaiming the three angels' messages, but we don't have time for Jesus Christ. And folk, if we don't have time then we will surely fall, just as E.J. Wagoner did. What a tragedy. What a tragedy. 
Ellen White wrote letters begging Wagoner to turn around to show him his peril. Why? Because Christ didn't give up on Wagoner. He loved D.J. Wagoner. And so Ellen White wrote to him in no uncertain terms. She said this, Satan is working stealthily to affect your downfall through his spacious temptations. He is determined to become your teacher. You need now to place yourself where you can get strength to resist him. Well, that's that devotion time right there. That's that time with Jesus that nothing else can do. That's the only place where Christ's righteousness is to be found on our knees before him. He hopes to lead you into the mazes of spiritualism. He hopes to wean your affections from your wife to fix them upon another woman. He desires you shall allow your mind to dwell upon this woman until through unholy affection she becomes your God. Folk, we would never be caught dead in a seance. We would never be caught dead letting somebody read the lines in our hands and tell us what our future is. But Ellen White says that if we are imbibing and doing things that we know are wrong, folk, we're in spiritualism. Why? Because we're holding communion with a nature that's supposed to be dead. We're holding communion with the dead, folk. And so Ellen White said that E.J. Wagoner was into the mazes of spiritualism. The enemy of souls has gained much when he can lead the imagination of one of Jehovah's chosen watchmen to dwell upon the possibilities of association in the world to come with some woman whom he loves and they're raising up a family. Ellen White pleaded with E.J. Wagoner. Pleaded with him on a number of occasions. A number of occasions. Tragically, tragically, E.J. Wagoner gave up many of the distinctive beliefs of Seventh-day Adventists. He still kept the Sabbath. He worked at Battle Creek Sanitarium in Battle Creek, Michigan. But folk, the Sabbath became a shell. The Sabbath became a husk while the inside was destroyed. It's destroyed. Nineteen oh six, Elder Wagner, after his wife had divorced him, married Edith Adams. This terminated his connection with the Adventist Church. A few years later he's at Battle Creek Sanitarium working in medical and religious lines. There's no record he ever opposed the Seventh-day Adventist Church, but there's a lot of documentation that E.J. Wagoner rejected the sanctuary in the investigative judgment and rejected the writings of Ellen White. So you take those out of the very heart of Seventh-day Adventism, friends, what do you have left? Nothing. Nothing. E.J. Wagoner was used mightily by the Lord in 1888, but tragically he began believing the Lord spoke to him and he took that above Scripture. He committed adultery and felt he was being led by the Spirit of God. He eventually rejected the sanctuary, 1844, the judgment, and Ellen White. Folk, we can't get too busy. Our heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Out of our hearts, we produce iniquity like water. We produce iniquity. Our only safe haven in this life is to start setting aside that quality time in the morning for prayer, 
for memorization of Scripture. Because, folk, that is the only way that we can be kept from the many erroneous and wicked deceptions of the devil for these last days. In closing, Desire of Ages, page 324, Ellen White said, the only defense against evil is the indwelling of Christ in the heart through faith in his righteousness. Unless we become vitally connected with God, we can never resist the unhallowed effects of self-love, self-indulgence, and temptation to sin. We may leave off many bad habits for the time we may part company with Satan, but without a vital connection with God, through the surrender of our souls to him moment by moment, we shall be overcome. Without a personal acquaintance with Christ and a continual communion, we are at the mercy of the enemy and shall do his bidding in the end. I'm thankful today. I am thankful today that God provides an opportunity, a way of escape for each one of us on a daily basis. That we can receive the righteousness of Christ to help us do what we can't do. God bless you.